It's the worst plan since Abraham Lincoln said, oh, I'm sick of kicking around the house tonight. Let's go take in a show. <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo UK. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 greatest BBC shows of all time. Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. For this list, we'll be ranking the most enduring, influential or otherwise legendary programming to air on the BBC. What's your all-time BBC show? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Are You Being Served? <laughs> anyone you know who's worked retail at some point in their lives and they'll likely have a ton of weird and wild stories. This is what makes the setting of a department store so much fun for a sitcom and there are few programs that feature this sort of setting quite as beloved or iconic as Are You Being Served? Thank you, Mr. Rumble. Thank you, Mr. Rumble. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you again, Mr. Rumble. <laughs> The show was unafraid to go broad with their comedy, employing everything from eyebrow-raising sexual puns to over-the-top examples of slapstick and physical comedy. Sight gags were the norm, and Are You Being Served reveled in being both silly and hilarious. So hilarious, in fact, that the show crossed over to countries all around the world, including the United States and Canada. And your inside leg, sir? Measure it. <laughs> <laughs> Number 9. The Office What's up? Oh. Fans are often very passionate about which version of The Office they prefer, so we'll leave that debate for another day. What's not up for debate, however, is how the original BBC iteration of The Office set the stage early on, and ended up becoming extremely popular after its initial run. Next time we're talking to him, just ask him if he got the grass stains out of his trousers, not in front of his wife. because. Ricky Gervais's and Stephen Merchant's original vision may have only aired two series, but they remain imminently rewatchable slices of classic BBC television. Gervais is brilliant as David Brent, while the romance between Martin Freeman's Tim and Lucy Davis's Dawn is one that we still love to watch blossom so many years after The Office has its initial run. No, I don't talk about my love life for a very good reason, uh, and that reason is I don't have one. Number 8. Red Dwarf Holly, activate the stasis field. OK, Frank. The BBC possesses a rich history of outstanding science fiction programming, but Red Dwarf has to stand out among some of its best. Actually, what makes Red Dwarf so compelling isn't so much the typical Monster of the Week sci-fi tropes or any heavy action set pieces, but rather the placing of traditional sitcom settings within the very untraditional setting of space. If you want him, you're going to have to come through us because you're big mouth again. <laughs> Is that the way you want it? Additionally, the main plot of one David Lister being the last human left alive after spending three million years in stasis is a dark one for sure. Yet Red Dwarf still manages to retain so much humanity with its cast of holograms, mutants and clones. The things this boy can do with Alphabetti Spaghetti. <laughs> Call it army. Alphabetti Spaghetti?! <laughs> <laughs> Number 7. Sherlock I was right. Right about what? The police don't consult amateurs. The BBC version of Sherlock does so much right with its updating and modernising of a classic character, while at the same time retaining one very important aspect of why we love Sherlock Holmes, figuring out his thought process. What's the final problem? I did tell you, but did you listen? Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman, hello again, are spectacular as Holmes and Watson, while Sherlock the series is this timeless sort of mystery programme that keeps audiences compelled and enthralled the whole way. We also love how Sherlock balances respect for the history of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, while at the same time ensuring that the series never feels like a retread and always remains fresh. The Invisible Man could do it. The who, the what, the why, the when, the where? The Invisible Man with the Invisible Life. Number 6. Monty Python's Flying Circus It's only a bloody parking offence. <laughs> In the world of sketch comedy, there's Monty Python's Flying Circus, and then there's everybody else. 
There was just nothing like this BB show's surreal and anarchic style of outlaw humour during this time, a bold and forward-thinking approach for each episode that somehow never became stale. It's the end! Oh, I destroyed him. Monty Python was art for art's sake, sure, but at the same time it was also intentionally crass and simultaneously intellectual. It may sound like a contradiction, but the chaotic structure of each episode, combined with Terry Gilliam's outlandish visuals, somehow made it all work. Monty Python's Flying Circus was an assembly of bawdy sight gags, highbrow ideals and imminently quotable dialogue, and we just love it to pieces. They wouldn't give it to us if we didn't pay for it, would they? I don't like this outfit. Why not? Well, we never break the bloody law. What do you mean? Number five, Top Gear. Let's face it, they're both gonna have a great time. It doesn't matter whether you prefer the OG Top Gear that started back in the 1970s or the updated iteration that airs today, Top Gear is absolutely a BBC institution. There's a legacy of informative content that dates back decades with Top Gear, whether that be the car reviews and analysis of old, or the timed races that are filmed today. The steering wheel is grey, the dashboard is grey, the seats are grey, the top of the gear knob is grey, the handbrake is grey, the door trims are grey, the pillars are grey, the sun visor is grey. It is so grey. Top Gear has also featured its share of memorable and popular hosts over the years, consistently bringing its style of vehicular journalism, entertainment and humour to an audience at home and abroad. Why do tramps live in London when there's all this out here? Number four, Blackadder. He's a complete no-hoper, isn't he, Walt? He certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, all four series of Blackadder are brilliant. We admit that we're just a wee bit partial to the final series. Blackadder goes fourth. We think you all know why as well, because of that iconic finale. Please take me to the ambassador. No, I won't. Balancing madcap humour, political commentary and the occasional dramatic scene can be difficult even for the most capable show writers, but there was something truly special about how this World War I tale finished things up. Blackadder jumped around throughout history during its run, but when the final episode, Goodbye, sees Captain Blackadder and crew going over the top and into battle, presumably to their deaths, well, they actually made history in the process. I'll do anything, sir. Yes, I'd keep that to yourself if I was you. Number three, Only Fools and Horses. <clears throat> we live in London, one of, one of the better parts of London. Yeah, Peckham. <laughs> Whereas Are You Being Served would commonly show up in reruns on American public television, Only Fools and Horses seemed to be one of those quintessentially British shows that proved to be something of a cultural touchstone, something uniquely ours. <laughs> the show was so popular that booster clubs were formed for fans who met, oftentimes with cast members, to celebrate their favourite show. Additionally, the slang used in Only Fools and Horses, like plonker and lovely jubbly, would wind up becoming so popular that it entered the cultural lexicon. Not too shabby for a humble little sitcom, eh? You can count me in. Oh, thank God for the great Gatsby here! <laughs> Number two, Faulty Towers. No, 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 immediate hurry. Drunken old sod. <laughs> Speaking of Monty Python, the troupe's own John Cleese actually co-wrote our next entry with his first wife, Connie Booth. We're speaking about Faulty Towers, one of the BBC's ultimate sitcom classics, and another crossover success across the pond in America. So that's two egg mayonnaise, a prawn gerbils, a Herman Goring, and four <laughs> colded salads. Cleese was reportedly inspired to write and star in the show after an experience visiting a hotel where the owner, in one of the words of his own staff, acted as if he didn't want the guests to be there. The effect was sort of similar to the more modern British series Black Books, with the same occasionally dark humour, albeit tempered with a heavy dose of slapstick and farcical misunderstandings. We just loved seeing Cleese's Basil Fawlty get his by the end of each episode. It doesn't matter. Well, it matters to me. Not to me, I got my Waldorf salad. Yes, excuse me. For God's sake! <laughs> Number one, Doctor Who. <laughs> Even the sonic screwdriver won't open this door. Admit it, you all know this was coming. 
because what other BBC show could possibly take our top spot? Doctor Who isn't only a BBC institution, it's a British institution. A show that's transcended the science fiction genre to become a subculture unto itself. Every Whovian has their own favourite iterations of the Doctor, their favourite companion and their favourite enemy. This is what helps make Doctor Who such a wondrous show in which to invest one's time. The level of history and folklore associated with our favourite Time Lord and his journeys throughout the universe. Although, if we're being honest, Tom Baker all the way. Yes, with a little help from a Dalek. But I'm afraid I've only delayed them for a short time, perhaps a thousand years. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Watch Mojo UK and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.